This Iceland, this Ishua land, has this magnificent contrast between light and darkness. When you look at those black plains, those volcanic lava fields, these volcanic areas of the world and the stark blackness, and then the beauty that arises out of it with those white babbling brooks made shiny white by the glaciers from which they drain. This contrast between light and darkness, truth and error, is beautifully symbolized in this place. And it is a type of the decision that must be made based on the word of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. this message mean? The hour of his judgment has come. We are living in a time of turmoil on this planet, wars, rumors of wars, natural disasters, riots, anger. Is this message relevant for our time? How does it fit into the present day situation? Let's talk about it. To think that about 2,000 years ago, there was John sitting on the island of Patmos and he received this amazing vision which has intrigued humanity ever since that time. It played such an important role in unraveling the issues of the Reformation. And it will play a very important role in unraveling the issues of the times in which we are living as well. And I was wondering, 
or whether we should not go into some detail and see exactly what this entails. Revelation chapter 14 deals with this tremendous opening of this throne room experience and the Lamb standing there surrounded by redeemed. And then it follows with this message that has to be given to mankind. The three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, commencing with verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So the everlasting gospel must once again be revived and it must be preached to the whole world. This is a universal language that is used here. Every nation, kindred, tongue, people, the whole world must be lightened with the glory of these messages. And these are not messages that are done in a corner because it says saying with a loud voice. So this is a very important message, a climactic message. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. Now, just prior to Revelation chapter 14, you have, of course, Revelation chapter 13, which uh, identifies the powers involved in this final struggle. You have the beast rising up out of the sea, and you have the beast rising up out of the earth. And by definition, a beast is a kingdom. It's a political entity. But you also have the image of the woman entwined in this beast. And a woman in the Bible is always a symbol of the church. And when the reformers studied Revelation chapter 13, they came to the conclusion that the beast out of the sea is none other than the papacy. Martin Luther, Melanchthon, Wesley, all of these reformers identified the beast out of the sea as the papacy. And the attributes that we find there are very connected to the attributes that we find in Daniel chapter 7, where the attributes of the little horn power, which is also a political entity, are also listed. There you have attributes such as a blasphemous power, persecuting the saints. All of these issues that you find in Revelation chapter 13 as well. So this power was this politico-religio system, the union of church and state, enforcing the doctrines of the church. Prior to chapter 13, you have chapter 12. And in chapter 12, you have this great conflict between good and evil. You have the dragon on the one side, and you have... Christ and his angels on the other side. And it describes the conflict over the ages. And history written in advance, it is absolutely astounding. And here a woman is described, a church, that would be persecuted relentlessly for this period of three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. And the reformers applied the biblical principle of the day-year principle. And so if you calculate these times, it works out to 1,260 years because the Bible tells us to take a day for a year. And subsequent to the turmoils that describe the persecution of the Bride of Christ during the time of papal supremacy, when this woman was 
being taken care of in the most solitary places and they preach the gospel dressed in sackcloth and with bloodshed spread the word of God whereas the politico-religious system was growing in stature being in the court of kings receiving the accolades and the homage that they felt was due to them being the higher power the spiritual sword wielder wielding the sword over the secular sword as well and the secular sword being wielded on behalf of the spiritual sword these were the issues under which the reformation took hold and then the woman had to flee and for all those years this war and conflict drove the woman the church of god into wilderness experiences and they fled and they fled to the various parts of the world where they could have peace and practice their religion and at that time the united states was being colonized north america africa was being colonized the australias and new zealand they were being colonized and protestantism spread to the new world with the rise of the power of protestantism complacency set in and again there was a regression just as we have in the history of israel you have this blossoming of truth and this adherence to principle only to give way again to the decline and the apostasy and deterioration and as you had those waves of apostasy and waves of faithfulness following one after the other the same was to happen in the christian world when persecution was rife people were faithful standing for principle even unto death but when things began to calm down persecution was not as obvious complacency set in and then there was this return back to the system as you had it before and god had to raise up another people and it says in revelation chapter 12 verse 17 and the dragon that is the devil was wroth with the woman with the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that which remained after the 1260 days or 1260 years of papal supremacy which by the way stretched from 538 AD when the bishop of Rome climbed onto the papal chair and not only wielded religious power but also wielded political power and then in 1798 this power was removed by the french authorities bertier marched into rome and abolished the papal government the secular government and the modern italy was born but this power was to receive its power back again And so the Bible says even though he had received a mortal wound the mortal wound would be healed and the whole world would again wander after the beast and therefore the schism that had taken place in the reformation should be healed and everybody would once again come together but there was a group that would be determined to stick to the principles of scripture rather than to succumb to the popular theology of the day and the dragon was wroth with this woman this church and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ the conflict between the biblical principles and those of the popular theological realm would be concentrated therefore around the issue of the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus which is defined as the spirit of prophecy 
The spirit of prophecy is that spirit which has been existing in the prophetic word through the eons. So the Jeremiah's, the Isaiah's, the prophets of old, they had the testimony. They had the prophetic gift. And so this message would form a compartment of the last message. The conflict would be between those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus and the unity in apostasy that would take place in the rest of the world. This required a specific message. And it comes at a specific time. And we read it in Revelation chapter 14. These three angels' messages. Astounding in their completeness. Let's read it again. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. So this is a lightning message. It is moving with lightning speed. Having the everlasting gospel to preach. Just at that point, what is the everlasting gospel? The everlasting gospel is the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's the good news of the Messiah who would come. And we know that this gospel existed from the very beginning. It was in actual fact conceived before there was any created being on this planet. We find the seed of it right in the beginning there with Adam and Eve with the first promise of the Messiah where the enmity would, between, would be between the seed of the woman and the dragon and his seed. This conflict between the children of obedience and the children of disobedience. We find it in Cain and Abel, where Abel brings the offering that signifies salvation lies outside of himself. And Cain says, no, the works of my hands should satisfy deity. And this conflict, as it started there, has progressively appeared over and over and over again in the history of humanity. But the gospel hasn't changed. When the gospel light had almost gone out, when in the darkness of the Middle Ages, which history terms the Dark Ages, when that light was almost extinguished. The reformers saw to it that that light would again once shine brightly. And what was that light? Salvation lies outside of ourself. Justification is by faith in the completed work of the Son of God. We appropriate salvation by faith by grabbing hold of the promise and relying on a sacrifice which is outside of ourselves. Justification by faith and not by works. And this conflict between faith and works, between the words of Romans and the words of James, raged in that early period of Protestantism and Martin Luther, when he discovered the glorious gospel of salvation in Christ, had a conflict with the book of James. And he called it the epistle of straw. But later on, as he studied deeper into the issue, he saw the relationship. At one stage, he offered his doctor's hat to anyone who could reconcile Romans and James. But after a while, he came and took the doctor's cap and he put it onto his head because he himself had reconciled them. You see, works were a consequence of the salvation and not a means to the salvation. So faith without works is dead, but works can never, ever save you. This is something that is completed totally outside of yourself. It is by faith in the Son of God 
that we receive our salvation. It is by believing the word and accepting it as though it were a reality. Faith is the substance, the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith becomes a living reality in the soul by which we appropriate the salvation that is offered in Jesus Christ. This is the everlasting gospel. Opposed to it you have the gospel of works. So when the reformer says you are saved by faith alone, the counter-reformation said this word alone has no place. And it was anathematized. The Council of Trent said that those who claim that salvation is by faith alone are an anathema. And so the stage was set for the blood to flow again. And the blood of the saints flowed, and history tells us what the result was. Millions on millions of people lost their lives because they took their stand either for the one side of the gospel or the other side of the gospel. Were we saved by works or were we saved by faith in the word? And today, there seems to be compromise. It seems as though they've reached the compromise position because it says in their joint declaration on justification where the Protestant world has aligned itself once again with the Catholic world and they've put the definitions together, or so they say, and have defined it that together we confess that by God Grace alone, in Christ's saving works, we are justified. But that is not the same as to say, by faith alone, by grace alone, is not the same as to say, by faith alone. Because grace can be administered also by other parties. Forgiveness can come by other means. In indulgences, for example, it is the papal system that dispenses grace by relieving the penalty of sins already forgiven, which should be worked off in a place invented for this cause, namely purgatory. And Protestantism acknowledges none of that because it doesn't occur in the Bible. So by grace alone is not the same as by faith alone. And by Christ's saving works is not the same as by the blood of the Lamb. You see, Catholicism teaches that there is a treasury of merit. And in this treasury of merit are the good works of Christ, but also the good works of Mary which the Catechism defines as pristine in the eyes of God. And not only the works of Mary, but also the works of the saints. So all their meritorious works are available in this treasure of merit, and the system can take hold of them through the power of apostolic succession through the popes and hand it out as an indulgence for the relief of the punishment of sin. That is grace. So when it says, through the works, it is implied in Catholic thinking that the works include those of others as well. But in the biblical thinking, salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. There is no other name whereby we can be saved. So this issue of faith and works forms a central part of the everlasting gospel. From the time of Abel, when he brought that sacrifice, where he by faith sacrificed the innocent lamb, pointing to the lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world, 
And that sacrifice was accepted by God. Whereas Cain brought the works of his hands and that sacrifice was not accepted. It is fascinating that God has always claimed that his work is complete because he rested after his work of creation and he rested in the grave after his work of redemption. So the everlasting gospel is once again to be preached. There is no compromise possible. As Martin Luther said on this issue, this doctrine of justification, compromise is impossible. It is the cornerstone of the gospel. And just as the cornerstone was rejected in the time of Jesus when they rejected him as the Messiah, so this cornerstone of Protestantism will again be rejected. Therefore, it has to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that salvation is by faith in the Son of God and that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Not glory to our own works, not glory to our achievements, but glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. What is so special about the hour of judgment that has come? Now if we go back into the Jewish system where the gospel was enacted in type, in types and shadows. There, the Jew was not saved by the keeping of the law. He had to bring a little lamb and he had to place his hands on the lamb and he had to confess his sins over the lamb and then the innocent lamb died in the place of the guilty party. That is the plan of salvation. That is the everlasting gospel. It is by the blood of that lamb that he received forgiveness. Forgiveness. 